in defense of Meredith Blake. When you're young, it's kind of expected that you're going to take a film and its characters at face value, effortlessly siding with the charming hero and loathing the suggested villain. But as we get older and gain new experiences, we're able to view those same films in a different light, empathizing with the characters we once detested and finding flaws in the characters we previously loved. This was certainly the case when I rewatched 2006's The Devil Wears Prada as an adult, discovering that Andy's ungrateful friends were in fact the true villains of the film, and empathizing with Emily's frustration with Andy. This retrospection is by no means a new phenomenon, and is especially prevalent when examining female characters through a modern lens, with the traits they may have once been vilified for now becoming the reason we find them captivating. Sharpay Evans and Jennifer Check are regularly on the receiving end of this positive reassessment, but I think there's one obvious example that is rarely talked about, Meredith Blake from 1998's The Parent Trap. At first glance, she comes across as cold, cruel, and conceited, but was that just what we were conditioned to think? Was she really the villain, or was she actually the victim? Let's get into it. As a child, I saw Meredith Blake as the ultimate antagonist, with her horrific treatment at the hands of the twins coming across as just punishment. But as an adult, I find myself not only empathizing with the character, but pitying her situation. Even though she's widely accepted as the film's villain, there are plenty of other characters who exhibit questionable behavior, which leads me to wonder why Meredith is the one we've collectively decided to hate. Meredith is supposed to be unlikable, with every character except for Nick Parker immediately loathing her, and in order to persuade the audience to feel the same way about her, the film gives her traits that have historically been used to demonize women. Being unlikable has been used to justify women's mistreatment for decades, and this misogyny is present in every aspect of our society, from politics to entertainment, with the same behaviors that are condemned in women being lauded in men. The film industry regularly depicts flawed or unsympathetic male characters. Just look at American Psycho, A Clockwork Orange, Scarface, or Nightcrawler. But on the few occasions when women are portrayed in this complex manner, like Gone Girl or Breaking Bad, audiences are quick to vilify them, forgoing any of the empathy and understanding that their male counterparts receive. This is even directly addressed in the new film Not Okay, where there's a content warning for an unlikable female protagonist, acknowledging that society historically holds women to a different standard than men, even in fiction. And we could interpret the parent trap's agenda against Meredith as being an inadvertent reflection of the sexism and hypocrisy that's present in our society. Meredith is an incredibly complex character who didn't care about being liked, and although this behavior led to her downfall, in many ways it proved that she was simply ahead of her time. Oof, ice woman. Proud of it, babe. Her confidence, competence, and candor defied societal expectations of young women, and in the film these traits, which might be seen as positive today, were framed in a negative light, making her out to be a difficult bitch when in actuality, she was probably the most rational person there. Because Hallie and Annie are the protagonists, we inherently find ourselves rooting for them, but if you take a closer look at their actions over the course of the film, they're actually kind of problematic. That might sound a bit harsh considering we're talking about a pair of 11-year-olds, but that's old enough to know better. Their desire to get their parents back together is understandable, if a little naive, and it's something I'm sure many children of divorce have felt at one point or another, but that doesn't excuse their incredibly selfish actions. Our culture has a fascination with reunification, which is why people still ship celebrity couples after they've already broken up, because from an outsider's perspective, the relationship seemed to be perfect. This is exactly what happens in The Parent Trap, with Hallie and Annie insisting that their parents are meant to be, when in actuality, if they broke up, it was probably for a good reason. While their pranks and schemes come across as well-intentioned in the context of the film, in reality the twins are manipulative, inconsiderate, and remorseless, but we still consider them lovable heroes. If the script were flipped and Meredith was the protagonist instead of Hallie and Annie, imagine how we'd perceive her actions then. She was happily planning her upcoming wedding when her fiancé's daughter, who she'd never met, treats her with undeserved hostility and constantly insinuates that she's nothing more than a gold digger. Then she finds out there's another kid, who her fiancé never told her about, and now both children are conspiring to break up their relationship. Then, to top it all off, when she goes on a camping trip with the whole family, the twins not only spend the entire time pranking and gaslighting her, but her fiancé does absolutely nothing to defend her. It's honestly like the plot of a horror film, and I'm not remotely surprised that Meredith snapped. 
and honestly, compared to what her 1961 counterpart did, her reaction isn't nearly as awful. Well, you give your sister her half of this! Also, can we talk about the absolutely ridiculous custody arrangement that Nick and Elizabeth have? You belong to your dad, and Annie belongs to me. His and hers, kids. No offense, Mom, but this arrangement really sucks. Splitting up your twins and never telling them of each other's existence is completely deranged. Not only does that imply that they think one twin is interchangeable for the other, but it completely disregards the mental toll that could have on the child. In Hallie and Annie's case, they're able to meet and befriend one another, but imagine if that didn't play out so nicely. What if they hadn't met until they were in their 30s because of a random ancestry test? Talk about a traumatic experience. Meredith is an amalgamation of several film archetypes, including the wicked stepmother, the child hater, the other woman, the high-powered career woman, and the gold digger, all of which are regularly made out to be the villains of the story. While many of these tropes have existed for centuries, they were especially popular in 90s media, and there were a variety of female characters who shared Meredith's unlikability who were also identified by the public as bitches. These tropes reflected societal biases against women, which were rooted in sexism and misogyny. And the female characters who exhibited these traits were at best reproached and at worst punished. You know where Meredith falls on that spectrum. The Wicked Stepmother is one of the oldest tropes in history, making regular appearances in folk tales and legends, and it firmly cemented itself in the film industry following the appearance of the evil queen in Snow White and the Seven Dwarves in 1937. Since then, the Wicked Stepmother has been a perpetual antagonist, with her inevitable defeat leading to the happy resolution of the story. While a few films like 1998's Stepmom have subverted the trope, the vast majority of stepmothers in media have remained wicked and cruel, especially in children's films, and this stereotype resulted in Meredith having the cards stacked against her from the very beginning. But perhaps it would be nice to have a new mother. Don't you know anything about the world of Angeline? Whoever he marries will be vile and treat us like slaves. There isn't one single stepmother in there who's even halfway decent. They are an evil breed. When Meredith first meets Annie, she does her best to start things off on the right foot, showing genuine interest in her time at camp and being considerate enough to wait for Nick to tell her about the engagement himself. Sure, she might have had ulterior motives, but who wouldn't want their fiance's kid to have a good impression of them? Meredith's first mistake is that she didn't account for Annie's opinion of her to be immediately clouded by Chessie, who is projecting her own biases onto the situation and is harboring some internalized misogyny. You ask me, she's doing a better job of selling herself than the grapes. Then I realize there's about a million reasons why that girl's giggling. And all of them are sitting at the Napa Valley Community Bank. When Annie treats Meredith with open hostility, it's somewhat understandable because she's already been poisoned against her, believing that Meredith is only interested in her father for his money. But that doesn't give Annie a free pass, so when Meredith picks up on this antagonism and responds in kind, it's more than fair. Sure, Meredith is the adult, but that doesn't mean she has to put up with undeserved mistreatment. Respect is a two-way street after all. Meredith doesn't actually embrace the role of the wicked stepmother until Annie coldly rejects her attempts at a truce, which is kind of petty and immature on Meredith's part, but also, I get it. After all, why would you keep fighting a losing battle? The child hater is one of those archetypes that has an obvious double standard. While the old man who hates children is simply off-putting, more times than not his behavior is justified, perhaps stemming from a bad relationship with his own children or some other form of trauma. And in many instances, his character is redeemed by learning to care for a child. But when it comes to women, their hatred of children is made out to be a blatant character flaw, coming from a place of jealousy or resentment that automatically reveals them to be evil. The continued prevalence of this trope mirrors society's inability to step away from traditional gender roles, with women who have no desire of becoming a parent being criticized, while men who share the same opinion get off scot-free. What would be a good time for you, Mark? There's just some things that I still want to do. Like what? Be a rock star? The biggest criticism of Meredith typically stems from her desire to get rid of the twins. But I think we need to acknowledge that she might not be completely off base. What's going on? Here's what's going on, buddy. The day we get married is the day I ship those brats off to Switzerland. Get the picture? 
While it doesn't exactly inspire confidence in Meredith's future as a loving step-parent, the girls have been pushing her button since the moment they met. And with their lying and scheming, some firmer discipline might actually do them some good. Shipping the kids off to boarding school is an incredibly common trope in film, especially in regard to stepmothers, with Baroness Schrader in The Sound of Music and Clarice Kensington in It Takes Two having the same plan as Meredith. Darling, haven't you ever heard of a delightful little thing called boarding school. Although Meredith shares the sentiment twice in the film, I don't think she's actually serious about it until the camping trip. You know, when the girls try to get her eaten alive by mosquitoes and nearly drown her? By giving Meredith traits of both the wicked stepmother and the child hater, her dislike of the twins is meant to be representative of her wicked character, when in reality, she's a 26-year-old who is about to become the step-parent of not one, but two incredibly bratty children. Considering they're actively trying to ruin her relationship and are practically driving her insane, I don't think she's in the wrong for wanting to send them somewhere where they'll be out of her hair. Also, have you guys seen some of those Swiss boarding schools? I don't know if going there would be the worst thing in the world. With her confidence, independence, and experience, I actually think Meredith could have been a decent mother if she'd been given a chance, but the girls' minds were made up before they bothered to get to know her. And I have to wonder, if Hallie and Annie hadn't switched and Meredith had met the right daughter, would they actually have gotten along? With women joining the workforce en masse during the 80s and 90s, the high-powered career woman became a popular trope in film. However, it wasn't as empowering as you'd think. Ambition leading to one's demise is a tale as old as time. Just look at Macbeth. And for women of the 80s and 90s, that was a harsh reality. While they were beginning to see newfound freedoms and success, they were also criticized for their decision to leave home, being blamed for the destruction of traditional family values. Of course, men didn't receive the same criticisms. In response to this outrage, the high-powered career woman in film often struggled to find a healthy balance between her job and her family, with the latter being the obvious correct choice. Otherwise, she was neglectful and selfish. Charlie, we went through this last year. I told you then, I'm telling you now, I can't work weekends. I've got three kids and a husband. Well, that's Mary Lou. She has no life. It means nothing to her to work weekends, but I can't do that. And if she wasn't a mother, then she was nothing more than a workaholic who hated children in general. Meredith is somewhat reminiscent of other career women like Miranda Hillard in Mrs. Doubtfire, Kerrigan Crittenden from Casper, Suzanne Stone in To Die For, and Cece Babcock in The Nanny, who were at best depicted as unsympathetic and at worst as cold-hearted bitches. The negative perception of these working women was in and of itself a sign of the times, and in today's day and age, these women would be praised for the very same things they were once punished for. And Meredith is no exception. Keep in mind that she's only 26, but was seen as responsible and clever enough to be in charge of publicity for a multi-million dollar winery. As someone who's around the same age that Meredith was in the film, I find myself inspired by her ambition and confidence, as there are many times as an adult where I still feel like I'm two kids hiding in a trench coat. Both Meredith and Elizabeth are ambitious career women who are confident in their abilities, but despite being so similar, Meredith is framed as pushy and bossy, while Elizabeth is driven and determined. These contradictions happen throughout the film, and you could effectively see the two women as foils of one another, with Meredith highlighting what's wrong with certain traits, while Elizabeth showcases what's right with them. This is especially prevalent when you examine the role Meredith's appearance has on the audience's perception of her. Although both women are traditionally feminine and attractive, Meredith is sexualized and is reduced to nothing more than her appearance by other characters. Because she's so intent on getting her parents back together, Annie refuses to see Meredith as a person and instead judges her based on her appearance and femininity. In Annie's mind, Meredith is nothing more than a pretty face that couldn't possibly have anything else to offer, and she diminishes her father's interest in her to exactly that. You're young and beautiful and sexy and hey, the guy's only human. But if you ask me, marriage is supposed to be based on something more than just sex, right? I don't know about you, but I'd get a little snappy if someone made that insinuation. Hyperfemininity is often demonized in the media, and Meredith's girliness immediately puts her at odds with everyone else, making her the butt of the joke and implying that because she cares about her appearance that she's shallow, vapid, and uptight. He and Miss, I'll just have half a grapefruit, thank you, left about an hour ago. I'm gonna kill my trainer. He says I'm in such great shape. Oh, I would pay big money to see that woman climb a mountain. This negative portrayal of hyperfemininity is still a problem in Hollywood, which is why Elle Woods remains such a pleasant and progressive subversion of that trope. 
And it's interesting to see that despite Elizabeth being a literal fashion designer, her femininity isn't depicted in a negative light. Around this time period, the other woman was everywhere, perhaps most famously in 1987's Fatal Attraction, which scared an entire generation of men into fidelity. In many of these films like She Devil, The First Wives Club, or Death Becomes Her, the wife is the one who seeks revenge, starting a trend of punishing the homewrecker as opposed to the actual adulterer. Meredith is similarly punished for being a homewrecker in the film, when in reality the only crime she committed was falling in love. Although Nick and Elizabeth have literally been divorced for over a decade, Meredith is framed as the other woman, someone who uses her beauty and sexuality to stand in the way of true love and happiness. Although she isn't technically going out of her way to steal someone else's man, in the eyes of Hallie and Annie, and effectively the audience, that's exactly what she's doing. The patriarchy often ties a woman's worth to her age and appearance, and the other woman plays directly into our greatest fear, that will be replaced by someone younger and more beautiful. Being young and beautiful is not a crime, you know. Crammed down our throats since childhood, we're told to hate other women, to want them to fail, to want them to suffer. It's society's way of pitting us against one another, and the film uses this ingrained bias to turn us against Meredith. While the career woman works a 9-to-5 for her money, the gold digger marries into it, choosing to weaponize her beauty and femininity to get the financial upper hand. These sorts of manipulative, money-hungry villainesses included Debbie Jelinski from Adam's Family Values, Ginger McKenna in Casino, and Shelley Stewart in The First Wives Club, and you'll note that all of them had some form of punishment that was seen as just, which was reflective of feminist movements of the time period which saw this sort of behavior as regressive. Using feminine wiles to get what you want, trading on your looks? Read a book, sister. That passive-aggressive number went out long ago. Chicks like you give women a bad name. Even outside of film, women who were seen as gold diggers were vilified, as seen by the horrible mistreatment of Anna Nicole Smith in the 90s and 2000s. As per usual, the man was absolved of any responsibility. In the film, we're made to believe that Meredith is only with Nick because of his money, with Chessie and Annie both saying as much. But is that actually true? If this is the real deal, then my dad's money has nothing to do with you wanting to marry him, right? While it's possible that she wasn't head over heels in love when they got engaged, after all, it's only been a few weeks, that doesn't mean she wouldn't have gotten there eventually. After all, Nick is hardly a bad looking guy and Meredith can't seem to keep her hands off of him. Honestly, before the twins started meddling, they seemed to be getting along quite well. And Nick must have gotten engaged to her for some reason, right? She does admit that she wanted a wealthy husband, but why is it so wrong for a woman to want financial security? I don't see anyone hating on Amy March or Lorelai Lee for wanting the same thing. I've always known I would marry Rich. Why should I be ashamed of that? There's nothing to be ashamed of, as long as you love him. Well, I believe we have some power over who we love. It isn't something that just happens to a person. Honey, did it ever occur to you that some people just don't care about money? Please don't be silly. We're talking serious. Because if a girl's spending all of her time worrying about the money she doesn't have, how is she going to have any time for being in love? I'd also like to point out that Meredith had no intention of abandoning her career and becoming a housewife after getting married to Nick, which proves that it isn't all about the money. She's just looking for someone to be her equal. Even if she was after Nick only for his money, it'd be unfair to say that he isn't getting anything out of the arrangement. Don't you know that a man being rich is like a girl being pretty? You might not marry a girl just because she's pretty, but my goodness, doesn't it help? The couple have about 20 years between them, which is one hell of an age gap, and people are quick to criticize Meredith for being a younger woman dating an older man, but there's little criticism directed towards Nick. How old are you? <laughs> 26. Only 15 years older than me. How old are you again, Dad? If there was a Reddit Am I the Asshole post about this exact situation, I have a feeling that Nick would be the asshole, not Meredith. Female characters are often put into a single box, good or evil, and I think Meredith Blake is a perfect example of someone who exists somewhere in the middle. Whether you think she's a gold-digging wicked stepmother or an admirable career woman with a killer wardrobe, neither would be wrong. It's all up to personal interpretation. So, to answer my question at the beginning of the video, I don't think Meredith is the villain or the victim. She's just a woman, and we don't have to be one thing. I hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you soon. Bye!